Welcome to Red Inca. I'm Jared Kimber, and this episode is about Jofra Archer. Recently, Jofra came out very strongly with some comments about some racism that was perpetrated on him by some random bloke in New Zealand who compared him to some random actor from America, and it's MAGA related. There was Tucker Carlson. It was, honestly, it was as stupid a connection as it was boring. To quote Samuel Johnson and Henry Gibson, the host of the video was uh, not only dull himself, but the cause of dullness in others. You could say he was not only stupid himself, but also the cause of stupidness in others as well. But I got on someone far less stupid than that and far less dull than that as well. I got Barney from The Guardian to come in. He wrote a really good article back in the South African White Ball Tour, in fact, you're in the middle of writing about Jofra Archer at that stage. I was about to go get my free haircut from someone in the uh, in the press box. But Jonathan Liu obviously wrote a piece when Jofra Archer was first picked. Myself and Mark Butcher have talked about Jofra Archer and the sort of the othering and the, sort of the racism and everything a little bit on TalkSport. But no one had sort of written the definitive piece as he was in the team. So let's start at the beginning, though. Jofra Archer is really good, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's an incredible talent, isn't he? And in so many ways. It's, it's really interesting. I always think when you hear fellow pros talk about someone, particularly someone who's new to a team, and talk about how awestruck they are just in the nets with this guy. I remember Chris Wokes during the World Cup talking about, you remember the slower ball that he got Glenn Maxwell with, mm. which I, I found a fascinating incident because Archer bowls a kind of off-cutter. And as it's coming down, you can see Steve Smith has read that ball coming out of his hand. He knows that Maxwell's been done into playing a drive, which goes straight to, I can't mid-off or cover. And you can see Smith almost holding his head, saying, oh, no, that's the slower ball. And, and Wokes later said they'd both been in the nets earlier that week and someone had shown them how to do it. I can't remember who it was. And Archer had come back five minutes later, able to bowl this thing, while Wokes was still putting it into the roof of the net. Uh, you know, and this is an experienced international bowler saying, wow, this guy is talented. There's a couple of moments for me. There's the last ball bouncer to Mitch Santner. World Cup final, last ball. <laughs> Mitch Santner can bat a bit. The idea of just suddenly bouncing him for me is just truly bizarre. There was the uh, Steve Smith incident, which the test, to be fair, shows us quite well. And then the other one is Leeds, where he actually slows himself down and if anything, bowls better because of the conditions. I remember that was the point where everyone was not sure if he was just bowling himself slow because England had almost killed him in the previous test or whether he was that smart. It turns out he was just that smart. I guess so. I mean, I, still, I suppose the other thing I'd say about that is it's important to remember also that he is really learning and I don't think he's totally in control of what he does. And do you, you remember the game where he came back from injury and he played for Sussex against the second eleven down at Blackstone Road? He came back and he got seven for nothing and I think scored 100 as well and you kind of thought yep that's a genius level guy playing against second 11 players and kids well I was there the next day with a rep team who I coach and uh, we saw him get absolutely carted all over the place he kept being top edged and hooked for six um, and he went about seven and over because he was bowling the wrong length he, he wasn't feeling that great you know and even there you could see well an incredible talent but he's still learning as well and I think moving on to what we're about to talk to, that's one of the things people perhaps haven't quite been able to grasp when you see someone with such obvious talent and ability to learn. But a lot of things are new for him too. Yeah, it's true. It wasn't that long ago I was watching him bowl left arm wrist spin for Hobart Hurricanes uh, in the nets and doing quite well. And he still hasn't managed to take a, a single wicket at international <laughs> level with his left arm wrist spin. He's got a lot to learn, that young guy. <laughs> he obviously is very different. But I want to talk about the article that you wrote in The Guardian how much of that article was written because of your experience writing about football and especially young, black, talented players, English players, I suppose, in football? Yeah, there is definitely a bit of crossover there. I'm always wary of comparing everything to football. But football is a little different to cricket in this regard in that obviously it's a lot more mixed as a sport and it's had to process these issues a lot more rapidly and a lot more publicly. Also, People are happy to talk about this stuff. On a more simple level, we've had the obvious comparison is Raheem Sterling, who um, has been incredibly vocal and very good at explaining the way unconscious forms of prejudice and bias work, which is not something I'm going to claim to be an expert on. It's very important not to claim to be an expert on things you don't know anything about, mm. but to listen to people who are. And Sterling did a brilliant thing two years ago where he started speaking openly to the media about the way it portrays 
young black footballers and saying, look at the way you've captioned this picture. Look at the way you've headlined and written this story. You report the same actions from a white player very differently using different loaded language. And it's really important to understand what you're doing here and the way it affects the way people are seen and treated. And for a lot of people, even people I know in the media, that was a bit of an eye-opener. And people were a lot more careful afterwards. And it, it was a very valuable service in lots of ways. Um, obviously, nothing's been cured, nothing's perfect. But in terms of a question of everyone becoming a little better at talking to each other and about each other, that was a kind of key moment. Coming into cricket, which is not... At, it's a very different place in many ways. And it's certainly in England, it's, um, there's two elements to it. In terms of what people look like, where they're from, or what colour you are, it's much more homogenised. You don't have teams that are as mixed as they are in football. And then secondly, there's the kind of team culture aspect, which we're very big on in England, I think in Australia too, where you've got this bunch of travelling guys in the same blue light tracksuit with the same way of talking about things, the same way of acting. And clearly there have been problems in recent years with people who just don't fit that template, who don't act like that, who don't react well to that. And it's fine when you're brilliant and you're scoring hundreds, but as soon as you're not and you don't fit the team culture, then we've often had friction. And Joffre seemed to fall into that nexus very clearly. And it's quite interesting because there's quite a few different ways he kind of falls into that. I'm sort of calling it the great othering of English cricket. So let's start with the very, very obvious one. England don't have a lot of genuinely fast bowlers, do they? No, they don't. And it's a, that's a really interesting thing and nobody really knows. There's so many different reasons why... We have people who can bowl 85, but not 90 miles an hour. Why should that be? I mean, I've certainly seen young, very quick, athletic kids being told to cut their run out down, bowl straight, pitch it on a length, worry about taking wickets in age group cricket. And I'm pretty certain that's one stage of it. I'm sure another stage is when you get to higher levels of actually playing county cricket. There's literally no point banging the ball in quick on April, May, early June pitches. You, you just don't get results. You're not going to be picked. You're going to be told to cut your pace down and bowl and get people to nick off to, to slip in the keeper. So, you know, it's partly due to conditions. English cricket's always been about control rather than blasting people out, going all the way back. But also there's no great culture, there's no great sports science of how to deal with these people. And quick bowlers always get injured. Something always goes wrong. This is what's always happened. Nobody wants that to happen, but it does happen. And who knows why? And it is quite interesting because we know the force going through the body. Um, Pat Cummins talks about it in, in the test a little bit. Brett Lee's talked about it a lot because I think he was one of the early maybe sports science fast bowlers. So, you know, he spent a lot of time with scientists and different people working through that but we now know that realistically the front foot no ball rule and bowling over 90 miles an hour they're not a good combination of stress points on the body and you mentioned um, Mike Selvey talking about us not really understanding fast bowling still after all this time yeah and uh, um, Selvey is he's very good on this um, I mean on one hand he'll say the only safe way to bowl fast is not to bowl fast which is kind of true that's your first <laughs> that's your first principle you know it's like Grand Prix racing like if you want something that's not going to hurt and isn't going to injure you at some stage, th- this is not that thing. But you wrote a very interesting piece about comparing Wayne Daniel and, uh, and Jeff Thompson, who both played the Middlesex with him. And the point being that Wayne Daniel could not bowl a ball that wasn't fast. Everything was 100% effort. That was his technique. That was his method. That was how his body worked. So he would just go flat out. And that was it. Whereas Thompson, self says, would have these periods where he found himself bowling in the 70s or where the rhythm dropped off or where he just didn't need to practice all the time to bowl fast. He needed to conserve that magical quality rather than constantly hammering it. And he compared Jofra physically to Thompson and said, this is a guy, it's about rhythm, it's about this kind of fast twitch mechanism in his body. And he does not need to be doing that all the time. He doesn't need to be practicing like that and he'll have days where he doesn't know why, but it's just not firing like that. Another guy who's very good on this is Stephen Jones. I don't know if you've followed him at all. Yeah. And he says the same thing. He says if he were to be coaching Jofra, he'd have him bowl six balls with recovery in between at his absolute quickest twice a week. And in between that, he'd have him bowling or, or just doing stamina work, just bowling within himself for half an hour. But to ask somebody with those physical attributes to have a 
eight over high speed full pelt bowl out against Mark Wood, for example, is just like head in hands. Like, do you understand how this works? And the answer apparently is not. And it's a very interesting Australian, South African, Zimbabwean sort of method too, isn't it? We watched Nokia play for South Africa and that whole thing of he's going to bowl 90 miles an hour into the wind with a piano on his back for this 12-hour spell. He's going to try and make a new Neil Wagner. But the truth is, as you said, that's not how all fast bowlers work and it's not how all fast bowlers should work. And I think one of the bigger problems for Jofra is right next to him is a northern lad who would literally run through a brick wall if asked and bowls himself into injury all the time in Mark Wood. And who's been injured a lot and will end up having barely played any test matches. I think the whole point, though, I'm not claiming, obviously not claiming to be an expert on this, but I am an expert on understanding certain principles. For example, human beings are all slightly different. The thing that bothered me was the little drip drip that you got from inside the England camp, that there was one way that human beings are, and that if you're not bowling fast, there's some sense that you're not trying Now, that was the problem. That was the bit that bothered me, that there was some notion of effort. Paul Collingwood talking about going full pelt, busting a gut. You've got to go bust a gut. That's the way it works. And that if your body is not allowing you to bowl as quick as you possibly can all the time, there's some notion of effort there. Now, that's clearly not right. It can't be right in any form of human activity. It comes down to writing an article. Maybe you don't write your best article. It's not because you're not trying. You might have spent 14 hours on it, but it's not going to be your greatest work. That's the way human beings are. And at that point, you start to run into other ideas and other kind of talk and other forms of stereotyping, particularly because in Joffrey Archer, we're talking about somebody whose talent just from the outside appears to be something that comes almost through relaxing into it, through a kind of absence of effort. And that kind of speed that comes not through sweat, but through rhythm is something that really takes me back to the 1970s in football and the idea of certain players being a bit lazy, you know, body language, not trying, you know, that that sort of thing. And I think then you start getting into quite dangerous territory. That's interesting. So I overheard a conversation and I didn't hear it well enough to quote it publicly with the person's name. But from what I heard, I thought I heard former England players at one stage saying he's a bit too West Indian. And I don't think they actually meant that necessarily as a negative on him as a person, but they meant it as a fitting position, as in he's coming into a different culture. And you talk about in the article, the Ashley Giles and Joe Root and all those sorts of different people. Uh, What was that? Ashley Giles said, basically, he said, culturally, he's different. So again, very similar to what I'm saying. I thought it was quite interesting when KP got involved. He talked to the Daily Mail, put out some tweets, ended up coming up on TalkSport. And... I think there's a certain point where it's obviously about the fact that not everyone in that camp thinks that Jofra is English enough or whatever their kind of terminology would be. But it's also that he's a very self-made person, a lot like KP, and he doesn't quite fit in. I mean, he couldn't be any less like Chris Wokes um, as a human being. And Chris Wokes is kind of the guy. He's the sort of guy that you can take him out of the side. He'll still train just as hard. He's a lovely person, good to talk to, hard worker, will do the donkey job if he has to. Joffre is quite clearly, in almost every human aspect, not a similar person to that. I agree. I've heard an awful lot of bullshit from former players about culture and being West Indian. You know, just chat around the place about this fella's a bit different. Yeah. And the people he's been compared to on all those occasions are other West Indian players who liked to have other recreational activities, weren't entirely serious, blah, blah, blah. That's the kind of talk you hear. And that's where you start to think, okay, there's some process of understanding here that hasn't quite happened. I mean, let's put it another way. Joffre has not been through the county age groups like quite a lot of these players are. Look at Joe Root, for example. Since the age of 12, he's been on the ECB radar. He's been through all the county age groups. He's been told what to eat, what to wear, how to dress, how to turn up to team meetings, what to do. Since the age of 12, that's been his life. Then you've got Joffrey Archer, who's reached the same point in his career, who is, in fact, a better paid cricketer than Joffrey. He owns more than the England captain after a year and a half as a top-level player. Well, he would do if the franchises were actually working right now. And, and he's got there without that support level. He's got there without that. He's not gone through those lessons. He's not had people telling him he's going to be an England player since the age of 12. 
Now, for me, Joffre Archer has achieved something there which deserves extreme praise, which shows absolute dedication, mental strength, focus, dedication, hard work. He's done it without all the advantages of these private school educated age group cricketers who he's alongside. So rather than those guys saying, well, he turned up late to a team meeting, he's having a Mars bar before we go outside. Why is he not having the, the protein gel? He's been accused of being unprofessional in those tiny little things. Those players need to think, where's this guy come from? He's reached the same stage as me in his career without any of that backup. Maybe there are some things I can learn from this bloke as well about independence, dedication and not being put off by all the things that life throws at you. So the idea of unprofessionalism, which has been levelled at him, is a weird one for me. You're not quite seeing the full picture there. This is someone whose professionalism should be praised. And that comes down to the team culture thing of not quite understanding why some people might be slightly different. So obviously I worked in the CPL with the Solution Stars and it was quite interesting that you very rarely see our particular team anyway. You very rarely saw them in the gym. And that becomes a bit of an issue. You start to lose games. The coaches start to look at problems with the gym and everything. But I know for a fact that Kyron Pollard would use the gym at about 11 o'clock at night. He, he would go and absolutely smash the gym at 11 o'clock at night. Incredible athlete that he is. There are a lot of things within West Indies cricket. I think if you look at the great era, the professionalism of having a trainer with them was one of the reasons that they probably took a step up from being very talented to being better. But of recent times, Carlos Brathwaite, Chris Gale, there's another one as well. There's three major uh, West Indian cricketers who travel with a full-time trainer. Now, Part of that reason is because they did get a bit unfit and they realized that there was a drop off in their performance. But I remember uh, being at the uh, World Cup, was it West Indies versus maybe Afghanistan or Bangladesh? And there was a local reporter there and she kept saying, oh, look at them. They're not even trying. And I took them through some of the workout routines that these guys have. And she was like, that's insane. And I said, but you don't see that. You see them walk out onto the ground the way that they walk out onto the ground. You make a snap judgment based on racist background and all that sort of stuff that as two very white men that we are, we're extremely white men, let's be fair. But we've heard this a lot and we see this a lot and we've both written about it a lot. The truth is that every culture is completely different. And even within the West Indies, the Guyanese culture is absolutely nothing like the Jamaican culture. And yet there's this big lump of this sort of laziness and they're seen as and, and you've talked about it a lot already, natural talents, whereas in actual fact, th there has to be a lot more to it than that. Otherwise, you don't make it to the top level. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being white, but it, it's, uh, it's a question of uh, being very careful on how you judge people. And that's something everyone has to resist. I mean, another thing I've heard fellow journalists telling me, well, Joffrey, just, he's just not fit. His, his basic levels of fitness are not very good. And that's one of the issues the England camp have had with him. And that's sort of difficult, isn't it? Um, obviously, they have certain ways of, of judging that. And I, I don't think I would expect him to be as fit at this stage in his career, in his first year of central contract, as, as other players. I think that would be a given. Mm. Um, I have to say, at the same time, I was on the white ball tour in South Africa, and there was a player who has been through... England Lions tours, age group cricket, who was patently not fit, <laughs> who, who was in training. Uh, you've got a guy there wearing, a, you know, a baggy long sleeve shirt uh, while everyone else has got the guns out and the vest on, whose fielding was terrible. Um, just clearly was not up to it. Looked like a club cricketer. Nobody mentioned that. Not a word, not a whisper. Not a why, oh, why, how's this guy turned up on his first England tour not looking very fit? Um, there's certain people who attract that kind of talk, and clearly Joffre is one of them. This hasn't been a problem for England cricket while it's been top-level professional. So since the 2000s, they just haven't had a lot of West Indian uh, players so of background, um, the Devon Malcolms and all that. Sort of moved. By the time they got to the sort of academy level, Australian level of professional cricket, a lot of those West Indian guys had gone. I know there's a few, obviously, you know, Mills has come through. You talked about earlier the fast twitch qualities of Joffre Archer. There are a lot of people from the Caribbean 
who have those fast twitch qualities, which is probably why they have so many great sprinters, but they don't actually have the sort of normal levels of fitness when it comes to being able to run long distances. Their bodies are almost so finely tuned for one particular aspect. So if you put him up against another England bowler who might have the ability to run longer distances, I mean, there are genetic differences between every single player. And if you're used to looking at the one kind of player over and over again, he might not look as fit. But as you said, I've done the last, a couple of the last tours of England, and there's a couple of times I've looked up and be like, do you know what? Samit Patel got a lot of flack for being overweight. There's a couple of guys here that just aren't in what I would think to be England's levels of fitness, and no one seems to be saying anything. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got to say I don't agree with what you've just said about genetic differences between people because I don't understand that. I've just finished reading The Athletic Gene. That's why it's really interesting. It, it, I'm not a scientist, and I don't... I think you start going down a strange path that I don't necessarily feel very comfortable with there. But uh, you can look at it on a much simpler level and say you're Chris Wokes. He's been taught to run from a, from a very young age. I, I, I have a son who is county age group fastballer at the moment. They teach them to run. They train them to run. They tell them to run. You've got to run. Running is a really big deal. And that is a big part of fast bowling. It's a big part of training. So by the time you reach professional level... You can run. You've got incredible discipline with that and with your fitness levels. And with you mentioned uh, Brett Lee. I remember reading that by the end, all his training and his warm up was sprinting. That's what he taught himself to do. He realized that's basically what fast bowling is is sprinting and running and being able to do these kind of shuttle sprints. Now, Joffre hasn't been through that. You can't expect him to have that same level of really hardened fitness at this stage. He may acquire it. And not only has he not been through that, he was a wicketkeeper. So even if in Barbados they had a similar system, he wouldn't have been part of that until he was, what, 18, 19? Because that's the point he becomes a bowler as well. And he wasn't always in the top-level system even over there. So there are lots of things when you come through it. That's also what I mean is because he has come from so much from out of the system – I do believe there's a genetic difference. And I think that you actually have to go through and work out different athletes. And that's not just based on race and background. That, there's a lot of different factors towards that as well. Exactly. Well, I compared him to Jeff Thompson earlier, who obviously, yeah. we're, we're not talking about some sort of racial difference there. It's to do with how your body works. And, and uh, you know, Stephen Jones, who I mentioned earlier, I think is fantastic, would agree with you. He, he says it's partly to do with getting your, your adrenaline going, to getting certain hormones going within your body that allow you to start flexing those fibres and really cranking yourself up. He says, you know, Archer should basically bowl a four-over spell and be sent off to fine leg for two hours to get his levels down. And then, you know, you've got to really, really carefully manage how you ask him to use those fibres because... They work best in a certain way. Yeah. And when you start exhausting them, you actually start damaging them and you start damaging his ability to bowl quickly because he, he's not designed for that long, slow. You know, it's like asking Usain Bolt to run 10,000 metres alongside a bunch of, you know, Kenyan long distance runners. He, he's not going to be able to do that. And it's quite possibly going to damage his ability to run fast. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's simply not understanding his gifts. No, definitely. And a lot of this is, there is a racial aspect to this. And because, as I said, the three other rings for me really are that he's a fast bowler, that he's from a a different cricket culture. And the third one, I think, has to be race. Cricket is such a weird sport when it comes to race. If you go back to sort of like the beginning of cricket, you've got Ranji playing for England, which that was happening in the late 1800s, what, 70 years before Jackie Robinson broke the barrier in in American sports. You have Crom Hendricks, the South African bowler, sort of being picked from nowhere and being offered to be a butler around that same period. Then you have the West Indians and India coming into Test cricket, yet again at a time when the world couldn't have been much more racist, late 1920s, early 1930s. And then coming through, you have the treatment of West Indies cricketers as they get good, you know, by David Frith and and the Wisdom Cricket magazine. It was David Frith's magazine that was sued by Devon Malcolm and Phil DeFratis, of course, for suggesting that they couldn't understand what it was like to be an English cricketer, whereas Dave Houghton and Graham Hick and those sorts of players could because they came from a, a different background. All the way through to the ICC playing conditions, which are realistically written the way that Australia, England and New Zealand played cricket and don't really fit into the way that, you know, West Indians and and Asian players have played cricket. It's a very complicated sort of backdrop, isn't it, all of this? It's not the same as as the football at all, is it? No, it's um, cricket's obviously the great colonial game, isn't it? Um, Mm. I didn't even mention that, you're right. (laughs) The only reason everyone who plays cricket 
who's not English, has at some point been oppressed or maltreated by the English. I mean, this is, this is the only reason you're playing the game. And so there's this sort of founding tension there. The language of cricket, the, the accepted norms of cricket are all founded in some sort of central place, which is not your place and which is telling you how to play. And it goes through all the way through ideas of cheating, spirit of cricket, ideas of what is and isn't acceptable when you're bowling spin and trying to get a few extra revs on the ball. And so the people who are now expressing these sort of microaggressions against Joffre, you know, the talk about trying, about different cultures, about being a bit different, they're kind of people who are kind of unwittingly transmitting this very, very thin, fine edge of something that's run through their sport for, you know, 150 years. So we, we shouldn't be surprised, shouldn't necessarily say, well, this is something you've concocted yourself, but we should be aware of what we're doing and try to reason outside it. I mean, that, that was essentially my objection to this kind of stuff I was hearing around that team. I no, have you spent much time with Joffre at all? No, no time at all. I've said hello to him a few times. Um, I am predisposed to think he is a nice bloke because when I took my bunch of under 12s to play down at Blackstone Road last year, he came out and waved at them all and said hello, which he really didn't have to do. And (laughs) he was in the middle of a game and I thought, yep, you're all right. So no, I don't know him at all. Like everyone in sport, I I know someone who knows, it will tell you then everything about about him. But my only quibble really is about language used and if there are things that you want to object to Mm. find a better way of phrasing that um because the facts don't always seem to add up to the talk no definitely the only reason i really ask that is because i think he's handled the situation quite well so far obviously the the blatant racism in new zealand even the other day when he retweeted the moron having a go at him comparing him to jussie smollett who if if you don't know jussie smollett he was the actor who faked being attacked to blame it on Donald Trump fans, but it ended up he just paid for the, the attack himself. So it was an incredible video. I had about a 10 minute conversation around a swimming pool uh, one day in South Africa, as you do. And uh, he seemed very nice, a very shy person. I, I remember Goffey telling me that no one seemed to know who he was in the team until they started playing, I want to say World of Warcraft, but it was like one of those online role playing games. I thought it was Call of Duty. I think they. Um... You're right. It was Call of Duty. Yeah. Yeah, that, that seemed to be a kind of bonding thing. I mean, he's clearly quite shy, but at the same time, he clearly knows who he is and what he's about. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, it's quite clear that that he is confident because this could be a very tough time for him because, you know, he is kind of almost on his own in that situation. And I just think he's handled it really well with a bunch of small things that could have maybe, you know, torn at another player of his age. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, he had an absolutely miserable winter. The abuse in New Zealand started it. And it's worth remembering that he himself had to call that out. It was his tweet, which actually, without that, uh, nothing would have happened. I don't know what happened there. I'm assuming he actually mentioned that to the authorities, to the team, to the ECB officials around him. But it was his own tweet which made it public. And from that, we all started to turn. He was supported and, and you know, we eventually had uh, some sort of process enacted on that. But there, he had to call that himself. You know, the thing everyone goes back to where he bowled so many overs in that test match. I tried to get Chris Silverwood to agree that that was a, a mistake for him to bowl quite that much. And he wasn't quite willing to go that far. But I think clearly everyone would agree that was a mistake. We had him being forced to do fitness tests to prove he actually had what we've later found out to be a serious stress fracture in his arm, which... I don't remember Jimmy Anderson being forced to prove he was injured at any stage. He had a terrible time, but an awful winter, which I'm sure is taken to heart, but, you know, might have really de- derailed people. Well, I mean, if you think about it, it's been an incredible year. He basically had the, the regulations changed so he could be picked. He had the pressure of that. He then was coming into one of the most successful one-day teams we'd ever seen, mm. you know, the most incredible machine, and yet he was being sort of jimmied into that. He then had players sort of not being that happy they were going to lose one of their own, and that, I think they were quite open about that. Yeah. It, it led to the Jonathan Liu article, which obviously led to a different kind of spat between uh, Jonathan Liu and Agus, but it, he was still around that. You then had, when he did hit Stephen Smith, do you remember the Australian backlash of him laughing yeah. while Smith was on the ground? 
All those sorts of things have just kept happening. And while he did all of that to use proper Ash's vernacular, he did it with a broken fucking arm, Barney. I mean, it's an incredible story. Uh, don't forget, he absolutely nailed it as well. If you want to accuse him of being weak or not trying or whatever, he came into that pressure situation. All the super over in a World Cup final, you know, and, and, and that nailed it, succeeded. Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. And yet there's some idea that he's not trying hard enough or he's not tough enough. I mean, I find that absolutely ludicrous. So many people come into these situations situations and fail understandably but he didn't coming from no international cricket to the absolute sharpest end of it he succeeded and has then had to hear people saying oh he's not quite fit enough he's not this or that but like you say yeah he came in and, and rode all that out and unless we forget this injury he was taking painkillers for it during the world cup and still playing like you know he was out if you remember for, for a game mm. came back on painkillers and yet, as people question his courage or willingness to play through injury, which is really strange to me, really strange. Thanks for listening. You can follow Barney on Twitter. Just put his name into Google. It'll come up. I'm there too somewhere. Please review on Apple Podcasts or whatever it's called these days. Tell your friends. Maybe do both. Tattoo it on your arm as a tribute. All the good things. This podcast is made possible by the people who support us on Patreon. So if you get a chance to help out, it certainly makes things easier for us. Red Inca is made by me, Jared Kimber. Nick McCorriston does many things behind the scenes that I don't really understand, but they seem to make things work. If there's any issues or guests that you would like on, tell me and I will ignore you. Thank you very much for listening.